now <coughs> we are coming to the uh, uh, conclusion of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, we have been looking at the six first factors so far. We're coming to the two last ones. Uh, and there's many ways of uh, looking at these two last ones. You can look it at from the perspective of how you experience the path, yeah, how these factors are personally experienced. Uh, you can look at it from the point of view what it is that you do, what it is that you observe. Uh, yeah. So these are kind of two different perspectives. And this is the nice thing about the way the Buddha teaches. It gives you anything from many different perspectives. So it gives a very nice and rounded picture as to what is happening here. And of course the experiential side is very important because what we're going to look at now is the experiential side, how we are ideally supposed to experience these last two factors. Uh, it's very important because it gives you the signposts of whether you are on the right track or not. Uh, so if you understand this, you know whether you're heading in the right direction, uh, whether you're having actually succeeding, whether it's working for you or not, uh, or whether you are or whether it's not working. And that's a very important feedback. If it's not working, uh, then we need to figure out why. There's always a reason why it doesn't work. Uh, it is not surprising that you should get stuck sometimes. Uh, this is part of the path, but then you just have to be honest to see why you are getting stuck. So this is this uh, inner guide, if you like, on how to experience the path. And uh, this particular sutta, I take it to be very, quite important. And the reason why it is important is because it is matched by a large number of similar kind of suttas throughout the Pali Canon. <coughs> this particular sutta itself occurs quite a large number of times in slight variations. So uh, this is one reason why it is so significant. Uh, but then you, if you compare it to the Bojangas, the uh, uh, seven, the Sambojangas, uh, seven factors of awakening, uh, again, it is almost exactly parallel to the seven factors of awakening. Uh, actually, we can look at that straight away, uh, because I have actually a table. I made a table this time, uh, so you uh, can have a look. So if you turn to page 31, uh, And uh, you can see that on page 31, the similarity between this particular sutta we're going to look at in a second uh, and the awakening factors. Yeah? You see that it's basically the same sequence with a few, few differences to give a slightly different angle on the same, uh, same idea. But you have all those important factors like joy, tranquility and samadhi which are fundamental to the practice. Uh, and then you have the other ones a little bit different simply because the angle of attack is a little bit different. You're looking at it from a slightly different point of view. So mindfulness obviously has to be there. Uh, page 31, mindfulness has to be there on the, uh, for dependent liberation as well. Yeah, the sequence we're going to have a look at in a second. Uh, uh, in investigation here is really just a not one particular aspect of the mindfulness. So obviously without mindfulness there is no meditation practice. Uh, and then you have energy and gladness. These two are belong kind of to the same group of things. Uh, because when you have gladness, uh, when you have this pamuja, you also tend to have energy. Uh, yeah? When the mind is bright, uh, energy comes with that brightness. And the evenness of mind at the very end there of the bojangas is just uh, an aspect of the very deep samadhi. You have the upeka, evenness of mind. Uh, and then in the dependent liberation sequence, you have a large number of factors towards the end, and those are the insight factors. This is what happens after you come out of a deep state of meditation, yeah? leading all the way to awakening here. But there's a very strong parallel here. It shows you how you, uh, uh, how you are ideally supposed to experience this path. Uh, so if you turn another page, uh, you will see the... Uh, uh, the um, similarity between dependent liberation and mindfulness of breathing. Uh, yeah, there's quite a lot there that is similar. Uh, if you go down the list, it's actually quite... Uh, here, there is a lot of similarity in the insight factors, because mindfulness of breathing towards the end is all about awakening, insight, uh, seeing things uh, according to reality. But there's also the preliminary factors, yeah, the joy, the tranquility, the happiness, the uh, the uh, samadhi and all of those things are also there in exactly the same way in the two factors. The mindfulness of breathing is divided up into more steps, that's the main difference, and it's more, the focus is more on perhaps 
a little bit more on what you do because it's more about f focusing on the breath, uh, whereas the dependent liberation is fully focused on what you experience, uh, not what you do at all, really. Uh. So again, a very close relationship. And because mindfulness of breathing is one of the most important suttas for meditation practice, or well, it's one of the few that actually talk about it fully, uh, again, it becomes important. Uh. If you f turn another page, uh, you come to, uh, again, with in the first column you see dependent liberation, which is the sutta we'll have a look at in a second. Uh, and then you have the six recollections, uh, and these are uh, things that give rise to inspiration in the mind. Uh, I mentioned those before, the Buddha Nusati, Dhamma Nusati, Sangha Nusati, in other words, the recollection of the Triple Gem, uh, Sila Nusati, Chaga Nusati, and Devata Nusati. These are the six recollections. And with any of those six recollections, uh, with, e with each one of them, this is the sequence that you would expect. And very close yeah, to uh, dependent liberation sequence. This time it's really, really close. It's almost exactly the same sequence. You uh, can barely kind of pull them apart. You may wonder what straight mind has to do with virtue, but uh, this is the idea of a straight mind as a mind which is not defiled. In other words, you see things straight. You don't have a delusion. Delusion isn't so strong. Uh, and that's why it is connected to virtue and morality. Uh. So you can see how these themes, they are found in the suttas everywhere, yeah, again and again and again, with slight variations. And when you see that, you know that this must be a very important theme. Uh, so this, uh, uh, this is one of the reasons why I like to read out this sutta, because it is so important and it occurs everywhere. Uh. And what is also fascinating about this sutta, if you look at the Agamas, uh, the in Chinese translation, uh, you find this sutta and it's almost word for word the same. And this is one of those astonishing things. This really is astonishing. You think about the suttas having been separated for 2,300 years, uh, handed down in different schools, uh, in different languages, uh, yeah, well, starting out with Sanskrit, then being translated into Chinese, and then being translated from Chinese back into English again, and then you translate the Pali into English, and then you compare, and it's almost the same. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Uh, so much history, so many translations back and forth, and still it turns out to be the same. And that just shows how close they are, how incredibly how conservative the whole monastic establishment has been in uh, preserving these particular suttas. So it gives you this confidence that this actually is the word of the Buddha that we are dealing with uh, when you see that conservatism in the Sangha over such a long period of time. Uh, so that it really is remarkable, and that is true for so many things in the suttas. Uh, if you look at the jhana formulas, for example, they are almost exactly the same again, uh, even though the suttas have been separated for so long. Uh, yeah, there's a ti few tiny differences in there that don't really make much, much of a difference, uh, but there's a, a few tiny differences. Uh, and a lot of things in the suttas are like that. It is, some of it is preserved verbatim, word for word, uh, uh, whereas uh, in other cases may, it may not be entirely verbatim, but it's very obvious that we're dealing with the same suttas. So that is uh, one of the things that kind of makes me excited about the suttas, the fact that you know that you, you're pretty sure that you are dealing with the word of the Buddha. There's not much doubt about that. Uh. So, uh, uh, so that is the, like the pedigree and, and why this sutta is so important, uh, yeah, why it matters so much. Uh. And um, so now that we have kind of established that it is important, it gets more interesting to read, doesn't it? Uh, if it is an important core sutta of Buddhism. Uh. So let's see what the Buddha has to say in this one. Uh. This sutta is called the Chaitana Karaniya Sutta, uh, to be done by a wish or making a wish as Ajahn Sujato has it here. And this is how it goes. Mendicants, an ethical person who has fulfilled ethical conduct, need not make a wish. May I have no regrets. It's only natural that an ethical person has no regrets. When you have no regrets, you need not make a wish. May I feel joy. It is only natural that joy springs up when you have no regrets. When you feel joy, you need not make a wish. May I experience rapture? 
It is only natural that rapture arises when you are joyful. When your mind is full of rapture, you need not make a wish. May my body become tranquil. It is only natural that your body becomes tranquil when your mind is full of rapture. When your body is tranquil, you need not make a wish. May I feel bliss. It is only natural to feel bliss when your body is tranquil. When you feel bliss, you need not make a wish. May my mind be immersed in samadhi. It is only natural for the mind to be immersed in samadhi when you feel bliss. When your mind is immersed in samadhi, you need not make a wish. May I truly know and see here. It is only natural to truly know and see when your mind is immersed in samadhi. When you truly know and see, you need, you need not make a wish. May I become disillusioned and dispassionate. It is only natural to become disillusioned and dispassionate when you truly know and see. When you are disillusioned and dispassionate, you need not make a wish. May I realize the knowledge and vision of freedom. It is only natural to realize the knowledge and vision of freedom when you are disillusioned and dispassionate. So that is uh, the sutta. And um, uh, the point of the sutta, as I mentioned before, is that uh, you are here. This is like the psychology, how you experience meditation from a first person. Uh, yeah, this is kind of the idea here. So it's a bunch of signposts uh, that lead you in the right direction. Uh. But before I go on about that, what is uh, kind of the most interesting thing about this, and I feel the translation by my good friend Bhante Sujato is not perhaps ideal. Uh, and uh <coughs> that's the uh, good thing about having good friendships, that you can criticize each other and there's no, no hard feelings afterwards, which is kind of nice. Uh. So I'm not 100% in agreement with uh, some of the things he says here. I want to point out that when he says, need not make a wish, uh, the Pali na chetanaya karaniya means something like not to be done by intention. Uh, this cannot be, in other words, cannot be done by intention. Uh, that's what he's saying. Uh. So whether you make a wish or not, in fact, uh, if it cannot be done by intention, uh, if you try to make this happen, yeah, if you try to use intention when it can't be used, done by intention, it means that you are getting in the way of the process. Yeah, if intention is not the way to make this go, and you try to use intention, you're actually uh, going counter to the natural process, and you're actually making it difficult to attain these things. Uh. So this is what I have been talking about all along, which Ajahn Brahm is so good at talking about, the idea of just being able to wait yeah, and make these things come by themselves, because intention is not really going to work. Yeah. So it is really all about uh, uh, allowing nature to take its course. Uh. So it says here, it says that dhammata is, uh, dhammata means according to nature. Yeah, he says only it's only natural, it's only according to nature. That if you have the previous factor, then the next factor will rise up. Uh, it is a natural thing. Uh, you don't actually have to uh, do anything with it. Uh. So this shows you how easy meditation is. Uh, <coughs> and how we have a tendency to complicate it uh, by trying to make it wor work. Uh, there is that famous simile of the a child that has a, a plant and a, kind of given a seed by its mother or something and the mother says plant the seed and then kind of you will learn about plants and how they grow. So this little child, I don't know, tiny, small little child that plants the seed in the ground and after a while, you know, it takes, takes a while, it takes a few days and then the kind of the, it comes out, starts to come out of the ground, uh, yeah? And then a few more days and it starts to kind of get a stem and all of these things. Uh, and then the child gets a bit impatient, it's going too slowly. Uh, so you try to use the will to make it grow faster. Uh, so you grab hold of that little plant and you think, I'm going to give it a bit of support, uh, a bit of extra oomph, yeah? So you pull the plant. Uh, that's what a, what a small child might do. Yeah, grow faster, I will help you. <coughs> pull, oops, too late. And this is a, like a simile for what happens in meditation practice. Uh, if you start to pull on your meditation, you try to kind of make it happen faster than it can, uh, then you're just going to destroy the meditation and it won't actually work out. Uh, it is accordance with nature that this process functions. Uh. So what does that mean? Does it mean that there is absolutely no willpower? Well, not really. Sometimes there is a little bit of willpower. I would call it wisdom power instead. Uh, yeah, sometimes you have to establish your mind in the right way. Uh, 
What does it mean to be virtuous at the very beginning? Well, that also means to put your mind in a virtuous framework. Yeah, it could be recollecting your virtue from before, recollecting any of these uh, anusatis that actually give rise to these wholesome states. Uh, so, there's a little bit of nudging can be useful. Uh, yeah, especially before sati really arises. That's why I call it nudging rather than using willpower. It's a very gentle movement of the mind. Okay, now, next, uh, what do I do here to kind of give rise to a bit of joy? Uh, you wait and wait and wait for mindfulness to arise. Uh, this process doesn't really start until mindfulness arises. Mindfulness kind of starts to come up. Uh, then you uh, nudge the mind a little bit in the right direction to get that arising, those qualities that purify the mind, where the virtue imbues the meditation. Yeah? And then this process uh, takes place almost completely by itself. Uh, this is what this is about. So, uh, and it's very interesting, because it's not how most people think about meditation practice. Uh, so what is interesting with the sequence then, uh, is if everything is automatic, uh, then what does that mean? Well, what it means is that the very first factor uh, is incredibly important. Yeah? Because if everything else happens as a consequence of the first factor, the first factor is really what it is all about. Uh, you get the first factor right, the more right you get the first factor, uh, the more this process will just happen automatically. Yeah? So that is where all the hard work is. Uh, not in meditation, but actually prior to meditation, and at the beginning of meditation as well, just to give rise to these qualities in the mind. Uh, and of course, so virtue is the whole thing, and that's why looking back at the s first six factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, they are all about that. They're all about how to purify yourself, uh, yeah, through from the coarser defilements to the kind of really light defilements of the mind, uh, all supported by right view. Yeah, that is where it is at. Remember, right view in Buddhism is also an aspect of virtue. Huh? So that is where it comes from. If your virtue is really, really deep, uh, then this process will happen like that. Uh, and that's why an arahant, yeah, they just close their eyes, bang, they go into jhana state, just like that, because they are fully purified. Uh. So it's, it's, there's nothing there blocking them from access. The, the um, things that block us from getting into these things uh, are the defilements of the mind, the hindrances, all of that. Uh. So if you're finding it hard to meditate, go back to the first step. Uh. Ask yourself what isn't fully pure in your virtue yet. Uh. Yeah, go through the initial steps. Uh. And uh, it's not that hard to, to know, yeah, you can know where your weaknesses are, uh, if you're honest with yourself. Uh, and remember that, always remember all the aspects of virtue. Uh, you have the aspects of, you know, that it, it basically uh, it consists of all the various aspects of who you are as a person, action, speech, the mind, so it's everything, even perceptions can be added there, because you have to have the right perceptions as well, because so all of these things come together, it's part of mind really. So you have to avoid the negative, then you have to do the positive. Yeah, so the positive and the negative, and then you're, it's almost like your entire personality is involved in this. Yeah, it's about who we are as people. So what you're trying to do, we're trying to establish that heart of kindness. And that is really what it is all about. And continuously, consistently, towards all beings, towards everyone, without any kind of exemption. And when you do that, that is where this virtue really starts to impact on your meditation practice in a big way here. Yeah. So that is the hardest part of all, yeah. learning to think in the right way, learning to see the world in such a way that you don't really give rise to defilements anymore. Yeah. And some of the things that I, you know, uh, have been talking about may seem difficult. I mean, Niwan, you had the question. Niwan, is that right? Niwan, Niven, Niven. How to, <laughs> how do you pronounce it? Uh, Niwan. Niwan. No? Niwen. Okay, Niwen. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you ask the question, it, and, it, and that's exactly the problem, yeah, because we have such a, we have a view, our view of the world doesn't really uh, support, uh, yeah, our ability to see things in the right way, it doesn't support our sila. So the view, we have to, that's where the whole idea of view comes in. Uh, and that's why we always tend to get frustrated when things go wrong. That's precisely the problem. Uh, so, ev so everything has to change gradually, 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 and that's why it is so important to come back to this Dhamma again and again and again. And as you do this, uh, you start to see how 
powerful it actually is. Uh, but it's a gradual change. Uh, so I recommend you, because it is so gradual, uh, don't always look forward to what you still have to do. If you always look forward to what you still have to do, after a while you get really frustrated, think, wow, I've been doing it for such a long time, I'm not, you know, still kind of, you know, having trouble with things. Uh, instead, look back at where you have come from. Yeah, what kind of person you were last year, two years ago, three years ago, ten years ago, I don't know how long you have been doing this, been on this path, yeah, and look back uh, and see how things actually have changed. Uh, and that is where you get encouragement to carry on. Uh. This is why I st I'm still on this path, uh, because I look back on my life and I see big changes. Uh, it really has worked. Uh, yeah, it made make a very big impact. Uh, and that's why you carry on. You feel that encouragement. Uh. If I stop making improvement, well, I would probably want this role, but you know, um, that, that's when you, at the very least, you have to look very uh, carefully where you are making a mistake, why isn't the progress there anymore? Uh. So this is, this is really where it is all at. The first factor there, everything else is automatic, coming down and uh, coming to the very, going down to the very end. So that is one aspect of this path which is kind of interesting. Now, the other aspect is of course where it ends. It ends with awakening here. Uh. Yeah, so if you get that initial impetus right, uh, you just become awakened. Yeah, so get the virtue right and then allow the samadhi to happen. So how, how does this happen? Well, this, this can happen aut almost automatically if you are entirely pure. You just go through the process like that. Uh, if you're not entirely pure, you may need to use the breath uh, in between. Uh, but you see the process. Dhammata, according to nature, just goes all the way from virtue all the way to awakening at the very end. Like one big sequence. Yes, yeah, so if you're really pure, it means awakening happens as a consequence. Uh, that's kind of cool, isn't it? Uh, so purity and awakening are very, very closely related to each other here. Yeah. So, um, yeah, sounds almost too good to be true, doesn't it? Uh, all you have to do is be really pure uh, and then awakening happens. But uh, that is what this sutta, in a sense, is saying. Uh, one of the interesting uh, links in the middle there uh, is the link between where it says that uh, when your mind is immersed in samadhi, uh, you need not, uh, you cannot be done by an act of will that may I truly know and see. Uh, it is only according to nature to truly know and see when your mind is immersed in samadhi. Uh. Yeah, this is one of those very important links uh, and one of those links that you actually see in many places in the suttas when you start to look for it. Uh, and it shows you the very important uh, connection between samadhi and seeing things according to reality here. Yeah. So what is meant here by samadhi? This is kind of the, 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 the critical thing. Yeah. Can it, what, what can it mean? And in, when you read the suttas, there's one type of samadhi that occurs much more than any other type of samadhi, and that of course is the four jhanas. Four jhanas being the uh, definition of samadhi yeah, in the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, yeah, that's what they, they actually call the four jhanas, that's what, they, what it is. Uh, and uh, other kinds of samadhi are far, far less, like with a big, big difference uh, compared to the jhanas. There are things like sunyata samadhi and uh, animita samadhi, and these are kind of uh, special kinds of samadhis, but they're not really important. The important ones are the jhanas. So what you can expect this to mean is that uh, may I truly, uh, if you want to really know and see, then basically jhana is the cause for not knowing and seeing. That's really what that is saying. Yeah. And knowing and seeing again, well that is, these are the real, this means of course seeing really deeply. Yeah. So this refers to, ultimately it refers to uh, things like yeah, becoming a stream mentor and all of that, and eventually all the way to arahantship. So this is one of those other kind of very important links in the sutta is uh, important to point out. It shows you the importance of samadhi on the Buddhist path. I think it's always important to make this point because uh, it, it sometimes there are, there are different opinions about this, but uh, to me it is very clear how the suttas work uh, and how the sequence actually is in the suttas. Uh. So, uh, this is the uh, this sequence. Yeah, and uh, one of the delightful things about this sequence, uh, when you look at it, it is everything is about happiness. 
Yeah, if you look at that sequence, it is just astonishingly astonishing how many of the factors have to do with happiness in one way or another. Yeah. So it starts with non-regret, or actually it starts with virtue, but leave that one out for now. You have no regrets, and uh, so that is, you can see why that is a kind of happiness, because a certain suffering is gone. But more importantly, the next one then is joy, pamoja in the Pali language. Yeah? From the joy comes rapture. Rapture is this kind of, someone was telling me today, they were meditating and experiencing this piti, this rapture in the body. Well, this is the factor, this is where you're at in the sequence when you experience that rapture. Yeah, that kind of strong waves or whatever in the body of kind of energy or, or bliss kind of going through the body. It's very pleasant. It's also a little bit um, uh, kind of uh, moving a little bit too much, but it's very pleasant at this particular state. You feel really your meditation really paying off when you get to this point. Uh, then you have the tranquility, and tranquility is of course also very pleasant in its own right. You feel really peaceful. Uh, you want to sit there, you don't want to move anything in your body. Uh, your body is already fading away a lot at this stage. You have no, almost no idea that it's there anymore. Uh, and you kind of feel like this rock, uh, there's nothing that really wants to move you in the whole world. Uh, and this is kind of one of those great little things. Uh, and uh, it's one of my, one of my little sto favorite stories that I can't remember where I got it from, probably got it from, I uh, can't remember where it came from anymore. Uh, and I think I probably told it here last year, but I, I'm going to tell it again anyway. Uh, is that okay? <laughs> And this is one of the stories, some of you went here last year anyway. And uh, so this is, uh, was from uh, Wat Pa Nanachat, the uh, International Forest Monastery in Thailand, where Ajahn Brahm was one of the people who started that monastery back in 1975. And uh, he was there for uh, how many years? T until 80, 1983, I think, so for 80 or something, he was at this monastery. Uh, and even then, even back then, he was one of the kind of the best meditators. He was always the one who was really, can, could really knew how to develop his mind properly. And so one day on the Uposita day, uh, yeah, on the on the one pra they call it in Thailand, uh, when there's the full moon or the new moon, uh, they all come together in the meditation hall. And the lay people are there and the monks are there. Uh, and the monks they sit on an asana. Asana is like a seat, a high seat, uh, just like here, yeah, a bit like me sitting on this <laughs> high seat. Uh, and then the lay people sit on the floor. And uh, so the one pra night they sit meditation all night through. Uh, so on this night, yeah, this is kind of a standard night, on this night sometimes people get tired after a while and then they leave, they don't want to kind of hang out anymore. Huh? So they're sitting, sitting, sitting throughout the night and then eventually everyone has left except for this one ancient Thai lady and Ajahn Brahm. And these ancient Thai ladies, they are the tough, really, really tough. Yeah, They've been sitting on the ground their entire lives. They know how to sit on the ground without moving for many, many hours. For them, it's kind of part of their kind of growing up almost. This is the way they've done things. This is in the, one of the poorest parts of Thailand, and they are used to that. Uh. And then so, so this ancient Thai lady, she's kind of watching Ajahn Brahm. Yeah. And the hours go by, one hour, two hours, uh, two hours, uh, and she's watching him. Uh, and nothing is moving. Yeah, it's absolutely still. And then after about three hours watching Ajahn Brahm, yeah, she gets completely unmoving. So she gets up uh, and she walks out of the hall uh, and she finds one of the monks outside and says, uh, "There's a monk in the hall. He's dead." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this is what it feels like when you become that tranquil. This is not that tranquility yet, it becomes even more tranquil than that uh, when you go into the jhana specifically. But when eventually you go into the jhanas, there comes a point where your breath stops. And you may wonder from a medical point of view, how is it possible that the breath can stop? Uh, how can that be? And actually it's not that hard to understand because your body is so tranquilized that your entire metabolism comes to zero. Uh, when your metabolism comes to zero, there's no need for oxygen anymore because the cells have stopped doing anything, yeah? So you become so calm that you stop the cells in your body. Uh, no oxygen is required, uh, so the oxygen level in the blood is constant. It's not going down, it's constant, uh, so you don't need to breathe. It's pretty handy, you not, not need to breathe, yeah? <laughs> So that is where it comes to, and that is why you look so extraordinarily still. I remember one sitting next to Ajahn Brahm at the meditation retreat, uh, and this is many, many years ago. I, I may have been in Anagarika still at Bodhinyana Monastery here. Uh, and I noticed that uh, when he was sitting in meditation, uh, 
the mosquitoes were just going around and around and around Ajahn Brahma. They never settled down. Yeah, and uh, I realized later on that the mosquito, they need some kind of idea that this is a person, this is somebody. And Ajahn Brahma was becoming so peaceful, the mosquito wasn't sure whether this was a rock or a person or a tree or whatever. Yeah, they didn't know. They were just going round and round and round trying to figure out. Uh, <laughs> on and on and on, uh, never stopping. Uh, I, feel, I felt a bit sorry for that mosquito, really taken for a ride, and this, this kind of half person, half tree. <laughs> so uh, and that was that showed me that you know uh, that here is someone's metabolism being so low, even a mosquito is not able to detect what is happening. This is the kind of thing that is happening at this stage, uh, and as you go even deeper into these things, uh, tranquility. Uh, so bliss, yeah. Then from that tranquility, you experience even deeper state of bliss. Yeah, because that tranquility is very, very pleasant. So that there's a bliss that comes up with that. And this is the sukkha. Isn't this kind of marvelous? Happiness upon happiness upon happiness upon happiness. This is what this is saying. It's just dividing the happiness into various steps. And one of the things you will often hear in meditation circles, you hear people say, oh yeah, I've attained the first jhana. How do you know? Well, I had, piti, I had a bit of piti sukkha. That's not really enough. If you look at the sequence, you can see piti and sukha arise a long time before you come to the jhana states. Uh, the jhana states are a particular kind of piti sukha that is achieved way down the path. Uh, yeah? So important to remember that, that uh, it doesn't mean just because you are getting some of this joy, it doesn't mean that you are in the jhana yet. Uh, you have to look for more signposts to know whether it's real samadhi or not. Uh, but uh, yeah, you are certainly on the right track, so it's, it's really good, but you, you still have a bit further to go. Remember, the jhanas are virtually equi almost equivalent to enlightenment, so they need to be extraordinarily profound. Uh, so you can as assume that you almost feel enlightened when you get to the jhanas, and then you are on the right track. Yeah. So, very, so meditation is all about bliss, all about happiness. Uh, yeah, this is what this says. Uh, and, um, so this is the right track. And you may wonder, is this all Samatha meditation? What about the Vipassana in here? Shouldn't this be Samatha and Vipassana? And the point is, this is both Samatha and Vipassana. The fact that you feel bliss doesn't mean it's not Vipassana, because when you come out of this, because you, part of the aspect of bliss is that you see clearly, your mindfulness becomes very, very powerful as you go through this, more and more powerful, you know what is happening. You can see things happening. When you come out afterwards, you can remember it very clearly. And then you, you, you understand what is happening. You have clarity here. You understand the process. Uh, you understand the things that give rise to samadhi. You understand what is happening here. You can see the hindrances fading away. You can see what the mind is like without hindrances. Uh, yeah? So this is not, not vipassana. This is both samatha and vipassana. This, well, again, this distinction we often make in Buddhism between Samatha and Vipassana is actually really false. It doesn't really occur in the suttas in this way. Yeah? Yeah? It should always go together. Yeah? And then you are really on the right track yeah? as far as the suttas are concerned. Uh. So um, all this happiness, yeah, Samatha and Vipassana coming together, and from that comes the Samadhi. The Samadhi comes from bliss comes from happiness. Why? Because when you are really blissed out, it's very easy to focus. Yeah? It's very easy to stay with the object. How can you not stay with the object if you're blissed out? You're like, you don't want to go be anywhere else because it's so happy. So you stay with the object. That makes samadhi possible because you have found something incredibly attractive. You don't care about anything else in the world. Everything else in the world is completely irrelevant at this point. And that's why you can give up karma loka, the world of sensuality. At this point you start to understand the disadvantages of the world of sensuality. Why? Because you have found complete contentment. When nothing is lacking, you feel complete for the first time in your life. You feel there's nothing really missing inside of you. Yeah, the craving, the driving force of craving is the force that drives us because we want to fill up the lack inside. We're not really fully content and satisfied. We want something more and so we're looking for the nearest drink to satisfy you. Let's see. It's quite nice, but uh, it's not the same as samadhi. <laughs> So, um, 
So this is how it goes, yeah? yeah. And this is why uh, Samadhi is so special, and that's why you can leave aside the entire sensual world, and that's why a lot of insight comes with Samadhi, a lot of insight comes with the jhanas. Already you are seeing very deeply into the nature of reality here. Yeah. It is not as if you have jhana and no insight, that's complete, that, 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 that's, that's impossible. Yeah. Yeah, because you have, s you have given up so much, and the only way you can give it up is by understanding that it's not worthwhile holding on to. So at this point, you know what is really worthwhile holding on to and what is not. Uh. So this is why, from this point of view, you see things according to reality. Yeah? This is the next uh, thing here, and then it goes down the sequence in this way. Yeah? So this emphasis on, uh, on uh, happiness here is so uh, powerful yeah? and so kind of... Uh, uh, in your face, and it makes it so obvious what this path is, uh, is about. This is the driving force of this path. Uh, this is what makes it possible. Uh, this is what makes it happen in a way uh, that uh, uh, all, the, uh, all the positive mental states that you can have. Uh. So uh, that is uh, that sequence. Let me go through all the factors just to kind of give you some uh, bit more clarity uh, about what is happening here. Uh. Um, we we'll just go through them kind of one by one. Uh, I, so uh, I, I looked at uh, some of them in a bit more detail, but let's look at all of them in a little more, bit more detail. Uh. So you start off with being, have being living an ethical life, yeah, and remember how broad that ethics is. Uh, so you really take all of those factors into account, uh, and then you have no regrets, the avipatti sari, as a consequence. Uh, and uh, so you, you kind of, your mind is freed of that burden, and that is what allows you to then experience the joy, uh, yeah? This is where it comes in. And at this point, uh, usually what you do here at the very beginning of the practice, uh, and this is why these things come about, uh, is that this is all about, all of that aspect there is really about giving rise to mindfulness, uh, and then giving rise to some kind of preliminary joy based on those uh, recollections we were talking about before. Uh, that is where that comes up. You use your ethical conduct uh, to feel good about uh, yourself and your life and all of these things. And then, of course, the joy comes out of that. Uh, so this is how it all starts. Uh, and then, uh, so that is the preliminary joy. The preliminary joy is just you feel good about yourself. Yeah? You sit down, you feel, good, you feel a goodness inside when you close your eyes. Uh, you know that you are living a good life and you feel a sense of energy and goodness because of that. Uh, this is kind of the preliminary gladness on the path. Uh, and this is a gladness that you can, off, some, not often, perhaps, but sometimes feel even in daily life. Yeah, we feel suddenly, just feel glad about things. You know, the world is going right, at least for you. Don't know about anyone else, but for you, it's going really well. And you feel that things are just on the right track. And you feel this energy and this lightness in your step. And you feel that, wow, this is w what a wonderful thing it is. And even though things may go, wrong in your external life and your job or whatever it is, uh, still you know that there's something broader, something larger that is far more important for you. Huh? So that is that kind of fairly, fairly common gladness that you can feel. And if you feel that gladness, you will be aware that it's actually a, a spiritual feeling. Huh? It's got nothing to do with sensual pleasures, uh, nothing to do with the kind of worldly things. Uh, it's something beautiful that comes from living well and living in the right way. Huh? And then you watch your meditation object. Yeah, this th in the background here, the meditation object isn't mentioned here, but you can assume that usually you would use a meditation object. You don't have to, but usually you would. So let's say you're watching the breath, using that as your anchor, if you like, yeah, and then you take that gladness deeper. Yeah, and that gladness transforms into even more powerful happiness. Yeah, the joy, the pity, called the rapture is the translation here. Yeah, the PT, which is like these waves of energy and joy sometimes going through the body. Yeah. And it gets even more pleasant, yeah? even more happy as a, as a consequence. Yeah. But uh, and those waves can manifest in many different ways. Uh, there are people always say that they kind of feel different kinds of tinglings in the body and uh, di different kinds of happiness. Some people experience this more physically, sometimes more mentally. Uh, it depends. But usually there is still a physical component to this. It feels like it is in the body sometimes. Uh, so this is that uh, PT. So still quite not super refined because it can be felt in the body, but still very pleasant and very, a very positive experience. 
but you're not really content, or you are, you are content, but you also know you have to go further. This is kind of the tricky part of the path. Uh, you have to be both content and discontent at the same time. Uh, you have to be content, okay, this is good enough, but also by making it good enough, you have to go deeper. Uh, so this is, uh, the trick is to just be happy with what you have and know that that leads to deeper states without craving for it. That's really the trick here. And as you do that, uh, you carry on watching the breath, then you come to that tranquility we were talking about before, uh, where you feel this enormous sense of just, uh, whoa, uh, solidity, rock-like presence. You want to do and don't want to do anything else, because uh, you are so incredibly peaceful. Uh, and at this point, the, uh, uh, the uh, body is largely faded away, the breath may be more and more coming into the background, it's likely still to be there, but uh, you almost have to notice it specifically, to notice that it's there. Uh, and with that tranquility comes the happiness. And at this point, uh, it is very likely that you will have uh, things like uh, a samadhi, nimitta, these bright lights coming up in the mind, and that kind of thing. Uh, because now you're getting very close to the uh, samadhi. Uh, and all it's all getting very, very, very pleasant. And then almost, not very pleasant, almost like outlandish happiness at this particular point. You, you really become, goes over the top. Uh, and then because the happiness is so great, as I said, then you come to the samadhi. And from the samadhi, uh, that absolute stillness of the mind, where the mind is completely unwavering on your object. Uh, in fact, you cannot move even if you want to, and you cannot actually ma create a choice at all. You cannot want anything at this particular point. You're stuck with that samadhi object, uh, happily blissing out for long periods of time. Uh, that is the samadhi here. Uh. Then, uh, when you come out of the samadhi afterwards, uh, because of all that, in, because of all those things that you have given up beforehand, uh, you actually get deep insight into reality. <coughs> if you compare this to the Anapanasati Sutta that we looked at very briefly before, maybe we can do that very quickly. If you go to the Anapanasati Sutta on page 32, page 32 you have that table uh, which shows you how these things go. Uh, and uh, here you can see that uh, liberating the mind, yeah, this is sa the same as samadhi, you liberate the mind uh, and then you have this uh, sequence of insight that comes from that. Uh, from that you contemplate impermanence, maybe contemplate is too uh, strong a word, maybe it's more like seeing impermanence, anupassi means like to look along with. Uh, you're not really making an effort, to contemplate might sound like you're making an effort, more like just you're seeing impermanence. Uh, you're seeing fading away, you're seeing cessation, you're seeing relinquishment. Uh, you see all of these things because this is what has happened in your mind up to that state. Uh, when you have liberated the mind through samadhi and jhana, this is what you have seen. You look back, you think, wow, it's all disappeared. The body has disappeared, the senses have disappeared, the will has disappeared, everything is still. There's almost nothing left, yeah? very little left at this particular point. Uh, all that is left is really bliss. Yeah, nothing but bliss is left. Uh, yeah, all you have in the whole world is bliss. It's pretty, pretty good, isn't it? Uh, so th this is what happens at this point. And because all you have is bliss, uh, and this is better than anything you had before, it means that all those things that you abandoned, they must be dukkha. And you see this straight away. Not only are they dukkha, they are obviously anicca, because they have disappeared, but they're also anatta, because you cannot access them at this point. You've gone beyond them. Uh, and when you cannot access something, uh, then by definition it's non-self. Uh, that which is self is something that you can always access. Uh, so all of those three things become suddenly bleeding, bleedingly obvious at that particular point. Uh, so you see things according to reality. Uh, yeah. And then the next one on page 30 is, uh, once you see things according to reality, then uh, you become disillusioned and dispassionate. I'm going to take the path to the end now, so this is going to be things that uh, may be hard to relate to, but nevertheless I think it's inspiring to know how the path goes all the way to the end. So why do you become disillusioned and dispa disillusioned here? The nibida means like you have almost uh, of you are repelled by something, yes? You are repelled by all of this. Uh, what are you repelled by? You are repelled by the five khandhas. Uh, you are repelled by existence. It may seem hard to believe that you can be repelled by existence. Uh, that is essentially what it is, because the five khandhas are just a particular way of thinking about existence. Uh, 
Why are you repelled by existence? Because you have seen things according to reality. You, you know, you truly know and see. And that means that you have seen the five khandhas as dukkha. You know that those five khandhas are dukkha yeah, through that samadhi that you had. And because when you know, then the mind turns away automatically. Yeah. You don't have to tell the mind to become disillusioned and dispassionate. You don't have to create Nibbida in your mind, uh, because Nibbida is a natural outcome of seeing Dukkha. When you see Dukkha, the mind turns away. Just like, uh, you know, in this life, when you uh, touch something that is painful by accident, uh, like a hot plate or something, or you put your hand on a hot plate by accident, uh, you don't need to think, should I take away my hand or not? Uh, if you think about it, it's already too late. Yeah, you already burnt yourself if you think about it. Uh, so don't, please don't think about it. Don't, don't make it into a vipassana thing. No, sorry, I shouldn't say that. Don't, don't make it into, oh, pain, pain, pain. Take it away, straight away. Yeah? Otherwise, you're in serious trouble. Huh? So make sure. So that, and that is what happens in the mind at this point. It's like that. It's an automatic withdrawal from the world. The mind just recoils uh, and has no interest in the world again. Uh, so that's why you get this dispassion. Dispassion is a lack of interest. Yeah? The opposite of craving, uh, where you give up the desire for the world. Uh, this is nibida and uh, viraga on this path. Uh, this is very profound. It's almost hard to grasp how this can happen. Yeah? How can this really happen? Uh, and you don't have to believe me if you think this is outlandish. Uh, what I would recommend is that just keep it at the back of your mind uh, yeah? and see whether it makes sense from your own practice down the track uh, and see how it goes uh, and then see if actually this may perhaps be what actually happens in the long run. Uh. So you become dispassionate, uh, disillusioned and dispassioned. Uh, and from that disillusion and dispassion, because you no longer have any craving, from that comes the knowledge and vision of freedom. Uh, vimutti jnana uh, You know that you have, uh, you ha know that you have realized uh, uh, freedom, yeah? You have direct liberation. Liberation means liberation from craving, liberation from dukkha, liberation from the defilements. Uh, all of that is gone. Bang! And you know that it is gone. And you don't have to, if, if you become an arahant, you don't have any doubt that you're an arahant. Uh, I wonder, am, am I an arahant now? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. How can I find out? If you doubt when you're an arahant, you are not an arahant. <laughs> That's very one of the very simple kind of uh, rules of thumb. You don't have any doubt when you come to arahantship. And even if you are a stream enter, you may not know exactly what happened, but you know something amazing has happened. You know something that had a tremendous impact on your life, something that makes you feel blissed out for three days afterwards or something like that. Something amazing has happened. You may not be able to name it because maybe you haven't got the vocabulary or whatever, but still you know something happened there. And then yeah, you have to kind of understand it as you go down the, down the track. Yeah. yeah, so the liberation happens when you turn away from everything, you become dispassionate, you no longer have, have any interest in anything in the world, uh, then craving eventually dies down, it's gone. There's nothing in the world for crave for. There's nothing of interest there. There's no so craving is pointless. Uh, craving is never going to give you any happiness. In fact, craving gives suffering. Uh, if craving cannot give happiness, uh, and also it gives you suffering, uh, why would you crave? There's nothing to be sought in the world that is of any interest. Even existence itself is not interesting. Uh, yeah? There's only dukkha, nothing there to be found that is interesting. Uh, so you let craving go, you abandon it. Uh, craving, in fact, is dukkha. Why? Because the will is dukkha. If you will things, if you want things, if you are searching for things, that movement of the mind is itself dukkha. The reason why Samadhi is so powerful and wonderful, one of the many reasons, is precisely because the will is gone. That's why it's so nice. You understand will is like a torturer. That's what Ajahn Brahm calls it. It's a torturer. So you can choose. Do you want to be tortured or do you want to be free from torture? That's your choice. I, most people know what the answer is, but uh, still we choose to be tortured because we see wrongly. We don't really understand what is going on. That is the problem there. So that is what happens at this end. It's very profound, but you kind of get a feeling for there's something beautiful going on here. You get this idea, even though it is hard to understand. Uh, now, remember that what this means, it means that uh, this is also the highest 
happiness that you can have as a human being. Yeah, yeah? This is kind of the point of this. The point is not that you get this empty feeling, oh, I'm free of dukkha, now I feel really miserable because it just feels empty, nothing really matters anymore. It's not like that. Uh, this is the highest happiness achievable by human beings. Uh, Nibbanang paramang sukang, the Buddha says in the Dhammapada, Nibbana is the highest happiness. Uh, nothing beats that. Uh, and this is really why this is so uh, amazing. And it's very hard, it's hard to understand. It's hard to understand because uh, how can the ending of existence be so happy? Uh, yeah, this is where Buddhism is so different from any other religion. Uh, all, almost all religions, they have some God idea, they have some idea of eternal existence uh, at some point. Eternalism is the by far the most common teaching in most religions. Uh, but Buddhism goes counter to that. In Buddhism there is no eternalism. Uh, in Buddhism happiness is something else. Uh, in fact, Buddhists, as a Buddhist, we would say that those things that other religions think is happiness actually isn't real happiness at all. Uh, because they even if they do go to a nice realm after they die, they think it's permanent, but maybe it's not permanent. Uh, yeah, and this is kind of the problem from a Buddhist point of view, uh, is that uh, there is a th that maybe uh, things aren't uh, what they look like they are for some of these other teachings. Uh, so that is where the Buddha really was revolutionary. He went against the stream of teachings at the time, which had to do with Brahma and the unity of Brahma and the Atman, uh, the permanent uh, permanence after you died and all of those kind of things. Uh, and he found a radically different path. Uh, and this is precisely what makes Buddhism so incredibly profound uh, and why it is so incredibly hard to understand. Uh, and uh, many people at the time of the Buddha, they criticized the Buddha for being an, an uh, annihilationist. Uh, yeah? You are teaching annihilation, no existence after you die, pass away. That's annihilation. If the Arahant dies, uh, but the Buddha said, no, it's not really annihilation. Uh, it's not annihilation because you are starting with the wrong premise. Uh, you're starting with a feeling sense of a self. And that's why you cannot understand that what this path is about. It's about cessation, not annihilation. And cessation means cessation of dukkha. That's what it means. Uh. And this is why it is profound. Yeah? It's really difficult to understand this. Uh. And uh, for that reason, it's just a guidepost, uh, but not something that you have to think too much about. As long as you enjoy your meditation, as long as you make progress, uh, the Buddhist path will be really of value to you in your life. Uh, and then see where it takes you. Uh, and gradually you will start to uncover these deeper truths of the path as you, as you go along. Uh. And this is the point of all of this. Uh. So uh, there you are. That is the uh, that is a very profound sutta. A lot of suttas are profound because they go from the beginning to the end. Uh, but there, I've taken you through the uh, uh, the whole thing and how that works. Uh, um, yeah, I could have a look at something else, but I think I will just stop it there because we're getting close to the uh, close to the full hour anyway. Uh, so let's just. Uh, uh, I think that's enough for, for this particular sutta. Uh, okay, so uh, let's stop there. And uh, what is there still some more interviews coming up now, Bobby? Is that right? Uh, yeah? Okay, so we I'll see uh, if anyone wants interviews, there will be interviews quarter to three. So we'll see you there.